and then I'll check it on my phone, make sure it's all set up. Cool. Welcome back to Community Coffee Time. Woo. Right. <laughs> okay, today I have Bryn Dunning, who is an occupational therapist in the Denver area. And I'm so excited to have you today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Super excited to be here. Yeah, of course. And we were talking a little bit before and we've connected before too. And um, what's really cool about my little show is even though, you know, I've talked to you about what you do, um, there's always more to learn for me. And then we get to share it with the community too. Totally. Yeah. Get to be compliments to one another and um, just continue to help the population that we serve. So yeah, definitely. Oh, and I almost always forget, but it is community coffee time. I have a decaf pumpkin spice latte. Okay. Well, I have a cool cup that keeps coffee warm, but I have water in it. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's everyone needs to drink more water. Yes. <laughs> oh, and it, I put it in the description and you can, people can watch back later, but we are going to end with an awesome sensory activity. So if you're at home and really wanting to join in, we're going to chat about occupational therapy. And then at the end, if you have a mixer bowl, water, a straw and some dish soap. We're going to do a sensory activity. Yeah, get ready. <laughs> I'm so ready. <laughs> all right. Well, with all the introductions, Bryn, do you mind kind of giving a short self-introduction and letting us know what you do? Perfect. Yeah. So uh, I am an occupational therapist and I am the owner of Made to Play Pediatric Therapy. Um, I recently opened Made to Play back in June of 2020, and um, I'm 100% mobile. I go see families in their homes or in the community, and um, yeah, my ultimate goal is just to make sure that children and family are um, reaching their potential and um, just empowering families to be able to um, access the community and skills uh, needed to succeed just in life. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And what a time to start a business. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's kind of scary, but it's been super fun. And um, yeah, just thankful for amazing families and just a supportive community like, you know, practitioners like you. And um, but yeah, it's been really good. So a lot of shifting and pivoting, but I think flexibility is an important skill to have. So <laughs> definitely, definitely. So do you mind for our viewers, uh, probably a lot of them will know, but um, I'm just curious too, in your own words, what is occupational therapy? Yeah. So I get this question a lot for people who like, don't know this. They're like, you're going to help me find a job. Like I don't need a job, you know? Um, so yeah, but basically thinking through like the pediatric lens, um, working with kids, um, my goal as an occupational therapist is really just to help them uh, reach their potential by promoting success within childhood occupations. Um, and what childhood occupations includes can be different for every child, but um, most commonly it's play, school performance, um, relationship building, um, motor skills, all of those things that you need, underlying foundations that you need to be able to just live your life and go throughout your day. So. Yeah. And then a big part of that, and I learned, I got to do Adam's camp yeah um last year and that you get into a group and they pair you with a physical therapist an ot and a speech therapist and at that point i think i'd worked with the speech therapist but not the other two so it was so cool seeing like ot in action and like the sensory aspect of it oh, and how yeah. important that is and like oh if i could pick your brain for hours and hours <laughs> on like sensory processing i feel like i like music therapists are always looking for more information on that for sure 
So could you explain a little about sensory processing in the brain and how kind of as an OT do you address it and address those imbalances for like the best processing and motor output? Yeah. So this is like the nerdy part of my job. Like I love to talk about the sensory processing um, aspect of our brains and how it interferes or how it helps, you know, just live life. Like I said. Um, so yeah, if I nerd out a little too much, just let me know. <laughs> Please do. Please okay. do. Okay. I, I'm, I, I nerd out about sensory processing yes, too. Yes. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, basically at the uh, most simplest level, like sensory processing is a neurological function. Um, and it's just the process of selecting and organizing sensations um, from whether it's the body or, you know, the environment um, and taking that information and organizing it in a way that allows us to have, um, you know, a functional or appropriate motor output. Um, and so, yeah, there's... Um, all of that's going on in the brain, like, you know, habitually, it's not something you think about. It's not something you have to like tell your brain like, oh, okay, I'm going to like register sound now. It's like, you know, that all happens just all the time, you know, a hundred percent of our day that's happening. Um, so then, yeah, like thinking about the sensory system, when we say like, what is the sensory system? It's like our whole body. Um, and, but we typically as therapists will break it down into eight different systems, um, and that is helpful to know just because, you know, not all of us like struggle with like all sensory systems. It might just be one or two that are a little bit like imbalanced or um, interfering with daily life, um, or it might be all of them. So anyways, just um, I can give some quick, easy examples for some of those, um, the more nuanced ones. But um, yeah, there's like the functional four, which most of us have talked about or know about. So there's um, taste, sound, sight, and smell. Um, and then there's the foundational four, which are, like I said, a little bit less known about, um, but tend to be the tricky ones when, it, when we talk about imbalances. Um, but there's the tactile system, which is touch. Um, then we have the vestibular system, which talks about our head movement um, in relation to Earth's gravity. Um, and then we have the proprioceptive system, which is just body awareness. Um, and then the one that we don't really talk about or hear about all that often often is the interoceptive sensory system, which is um, just telling us about our internal body senses. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, a, those are the foundational four, which like I said, um, tend to be a little bit sticky sometimes for kiddos. Um, but yeah, like when we talk about that habitual neurological process that's happening too, um, like we can break it down into kind of three different parts, which um, as a therapist is helpful for me when I'm working with clients who have sensory processing disorder or imbalances, um, because where the breakdown is matters and how I would like work with a child. Um, so yeah, thinking about that process, like there's three different steps. Um, so there's the sensory registration piece, the sensory modulation piece, and then sensory integration. Um, so yeah, like registering, like right now yeah. I am registering that, like I'm hearing through my headphones, the auditory system is telling me like, I'm talking to somebody, I have sound coming into my ears. Um, that's the registration piece. Um, and then a lot of times modulation is like, what our response is like, you know, am I like freaking out because it's too loud? Oh my gosh, I didn't turn the volume down or, you know, like, oh, nope, that's just right. And I can just attend to it. Um, and then that integration piece is more of that motor output, like, oh, okay, yeah, like I'm listening, I hear it, I can talk, I can, inter I can interact, and it's not interfering with my function right now. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, you know, all of us, I mean, fortunately, all of us are sensory beings. So we all have different needs and different um, levels of sensory input that feel good for our bodies and different levels that don't feel so good. So um, yeah, when I work with kiddos who have sensory processing imbalances or a disorder, um, oftentimes there is that breakdown in one of those three areas, the registration, modulation, or integration. Um, and so my job as the OT um, is to figure out where the breakdown is. Um, and then I look at those eight sensory systems that we just kind of talked about. Um, and I often give standardized testing to say like, okay, this is the sensory system um, that seems like is the most you know, tricky for your child. And then again, like my job is to give the strategies, um, adaptations, 
or interventions that will help either, you know, kind of remediate and improve that sensory system so that therefore function is improved um, or to adapt and, you know, compensate and just find different strategies to make, you know, make up for something that's a little bit hard sensory wise. That's awesome. Oh, I love it yeah. so much. Yeah. <laughs> and music therapy, I feel like we're constantly, you know, trying to catch up with some of this information on sensory uh, knowledge, like, uh, and I love that process breakdown. And I feel like that's definitely too. And like, maybe you need to collaborate with an OT, mm -hmm. like know your kind of scope of practice to figure out where that's happening with a client. And um, yeah, but we do like all kinds of proprioceptives, a huge one yeah. that we're, we target in music therapy because uh, with like movement kind of activities. Totally. And, um, yeah. It's just really, really cool stuff. Um, yeah. I kind of had a question. Yeah. So when a kiddo like is diagnosed with sensory processing disorder, is that something that follows them their whole life or do they kind of develop a coping mechanism or is it really different like for in every individual? Yeah. It's kind of like one of those, like, it depends questions. Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, all of it, we're just sensory beings, every human. Um, and so you can't, um, like maybe in childhood, you um, have like dysfunction within a sensory system um, and maybe you got help and it got better. And like, you know, you don't have to worry about that as an adult. So there is, you know, the possibility of, you know, working through sensory processing disorder and being able to interact, interact um, in your daily life without any issues. But there's also sometimes like, sometimes, you know, it's just, a, it's a neurological process and yes, the brain is plastic and it's changing, especially in, um, in early childhood. Um, but sometimes, you know, I'm not just like a miracle worker and I don't have a crystal ball to say like, okay, if we do this X, Y, Z, then like, it's going to be a hundred percent fix. That's just right. unfortunately not the way that our sensory systems work. Um, but I think, you know, early intervention is key. So, like I said, definitely getting help and addressing those needs early on can be really, really um, impactful for kids um, to be able to hopefully as adults, you know, not struggle with um, different things. But like I said, we're all sensory beings and we right. do find like coping mechanisms. And so, you know, even just like the pencil clickers, like in mm -hmm. class or like the thigh jigglers, you know, like um, those are all kind of like sensory needs. And um, luckily, I think our society is really like changing um, almost for the better of like being able to accommodate a lot of different needs and it be very quote unquote normal. I, I don't love that word, but like I said, yeah. I think, yeah, we all find our, find what works best for us and accommodate and either people are okay with it or they're not. And we still do what we need to do to be able to get through our day regardless. Right. And working towards that kind of advocacy of like, it's okay to like let people yeah. do what they need to do to like totally. comfortably sensory process yeah. environments. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just even like headphones, for example, like, I think that's been a cool like shift just the last like few years, like seeing like people go from, you know, these that are like a little more pro low profile, but maybe like that really bothers the way like the insides of your ears feel. So like you can oh, go, I hate, yeah, I hate yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't have the cool ones that you have, so I have to just kind of suck it up and modulate a little bit and just be okay with this. But, right. um, but yeah, I think um, it's been really cool shift within like the sensory community to see like more acceptance of a lot of different types of needs and, um, not like shaming people um, for for what needs they do have. So, right. Have you been to the um, autism community store? Yeah, I have. They have so many amazing. Right. Things I walked for... around there once and was just like, "This is sensory." <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're almost like I'm a little like overstimulated by the <laughs> amount of options that I have right now. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to link them in the description. But they've got a lot of, especially like the little things that you're talking about. Yeah. And, and, um, so with like a stress ball, is that tactile? Would you yeah. uh, kind of categorize that? Okay, cool. Yeah, and we'll kind of sometimes call that a fidget. Um, so yeah, like the the fidget spinners, like, you know, the right. things that probably every teacher hates. Um, <laughs> yeah, like that's a fidget. That's like probably like helps with some sensory modulation and regulation. So um, yeah, lots of different strategies. And like you said, the autism community store is a great resource to, to find out what works best for your kiddos or for you right. personally. So yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So uh, this was touched on briefly before you mentioned play as an aspect of your work. So I would love to like talk about that a little more 
Um, would you mind kind of describing your philosophy and that importance of play in therapy? Yes. So um, I'm, I love play within therapy, hence the name of my company <laughs> made to play. Um, because just like we are all sensory beings, um, we are born and learn through play in early childhood. So play is so, so important for kids. Um, and it's their main form of learning right now, especially like that, like I said, that early childhood age, that is how they learn is through play. Um, and so for me as an OT, like I go in not really with a lot of plans for a session. So, um, because who knows, you know, one, where a child's sensory system is that day, but two, like, well, what's motivating one day might not be motivating the next day. And, um, and so motivation is a part of play. Like, you know, when right. kids, you know, seek out certain toys, like that's because they're, they're motivated by that. Um, and so I try to really honor whatever a child is showing me that day, um, with their sensory system, but also through their choice of play. Um, because, you know, we as practitioners know this and a lot of families know this, but if a kiddo doesn't want to do it, they're not going to do it. <laughs> so, um, so for my peace of mind and also for, you know, the enjoyment of a child in therapy, like they need to be motivated and honored in what they're choosing. Um, so that's like a huge piece of therapy for me. Um, the other aspect of play is, um, relationship building. You know, we, um, we learn through play. Um, and when we are playing, like whether it's, you know, in solitary or in parallel with other peers or, you know, cooperatively, um, that is a form of building relationships and a very like foundational part of social participation. Um, so I really try and look at play through those lenses too, of if, if they don't have my trust or, you know, child doesn't trust me, uh, why would they ever listen to anything hard that I'm ever going to tell them to do or, you know, an activity that might be scary for them? Why would they trust me um, in doing that if we don't have that foundation yet of a relationship? So, um, so before really play can happen and like all of those hard things that we have to work on in therapy can really happen. There has to be that foundation of a relationship and play is a great way to build that. So Awesome. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like I'll probably just be reiterating what you're saying, but <laughs> like, I completely agree. And I love when I can like tap into like that play aspect in music therapy or music lessons, because it does just build that trust and that creativity totally. and that intrinsic motivation. Yeah. Um, cause they'll improve so much more cause they'll even want to go do it when you're not there if you're building that intrinsic motivation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, today I did a session solely around Michael Jackson. Um, you know, that's what was motivating for my kiddo. And, you know, we, we worked on the sensory piece. We worked on handwriting. We got so much done because he was motivated, motivated around this one topic. And so I'm all for it. I can be flexible with how I interact and how I, you know, therapeutically use those motivations. But um, yeah, ultimately, you know, it's, it's play that is motivating and um, a big learning piece for kids. So. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. It's still like goal oriented. Right. Like it's like a tr trickier way at times to kind of approach sessions because you do put so much trust and so much like lead on the client, but mm -hmm. Um, as therapists, we still have that, the goals in our mind and t can like kind of, you know, lead things a little bit or be like, oh, cool, we're doing this. I can make, I can form that around my goal, like totally and, like have them kind of lead things too. Yeah. And it's, you know, play and, and just like you said, it's using the, that as like a leading part of therapy. You know, it's a, it's a great way to really analyze the session and say like, wow, this is going really, really well. Like I can maybe like through this play activity, I can maybe like make it a little bit harder because they're tolerating it really well. Or um, especially like I'm very plan oriented. And so it is hard sometimes to not yeah, like go into a session and be like, this is what I'm going to do, you know? Um, but, you know, days that I maybe was like a little bit too planned and I see, wow, this is going really poorly. Like I need to step it back, uh, maybe like grade down the activity or like really focus more on the play piece before I can push the boundaries a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Just that rapport building over yep. and over. 
Yep, for sure. Kind of kind of sidetracked, but if you need another Michael Jackson, <laughs> <laughs> uh, drumming to beat it is always a hit. Okay, cool. Yeah, we've done <laughs> we've done the metronomes, but yeah, drumming that'd be great. Yeah, oh, it's so good, and and like you know, I feel like you can go beat it, like do that rhythm really yep. easy, like yep. on it. Yeah, For I've sure. done different things to that. That's awesome. Sure. And man, yeah. Oh, Halloween like, thriller. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And as a therapist, I'm like, okay, there's some coordination. There's the sensory piece. Yeah, you can just, you can do it all. So. Right. And then I'll like, I can go on and on and on about drumming. And one, there's so many benefits of drumming and I'm a percussionist, but one is like that sensory aspect. Mm -hmm. And in my sessions, I'll try to do drumming really early because you can even do something as simple as drumming like to the right and the left mm-hmm. and there's just so much like motor sensory yeah. coordination going on that it gives a lot of the kiddos I work with what yep. they need before I ask them to play maybe a difficult ukulele chord or whatever we're working on and and um yeah so that's yeah. that's at least my most sensory moment oh, but um I, there's still I so much it. I can learn too yeah I'm gonna have to keep that one in the back of my mind too so yeah, there might be a blog post about it. Maybe I can okay. include it in the description. Check later. it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see. So, with COVID, how have you pivoted? You mentioned a lot of pivoting. What yep. are you up to now? Yeah. And, um, how, and maybe we can even tie it up. How can people reach you? Um, I'll try to include your website and social in the description later. But I'll, like, what are you up to, and how can how can they find you? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, given I started this company in the middle of the pandemic, I think, you know, my model has been kind of born out of the needs of, you know, families during COVID-19. Um, so I'm hundred percent mobile. And I think the biggest shift is, you know, I've typically like in one space and kids come to me and see me and, Um, so yeah, lately I'm, I'm going to kids' homes and, or, you know, we're at the park or, you know, we're going to target because there's a lot of things going on in target that we need to work on. And, um, so yeah, that's kind of been a shift, but it's been super fun. Um, and yeah, the sensory piece of, you know, of home and, you know, a child's function has been a really, uh, challenging, but also, you know, a really gratifying way to, to help families on the most basic needs within their home. Um, so I really enjoyed just, yeah, being in families' homes. Um, we've been trying to be more outside. So yeah, going to the park or in the backyard or front yard, um, just to keep, you know, me safe, kiddos safe, family safe. Um, been writing a lot of social stories about what, you know, a mask (laughs) means or what that looks like and why we can't high five and, um, things like that. So that's kind of been, you know, some shifting in terms of what sessions have looked like with kiddos, Um, but yeah, ultimately, like I said, I think it's been really good, um, a a good stretch. And like I said, um, a challenge in constantly being flexible, not getting stuck on, this is the only way you can do therapy. Um, this is the only way or the best way, but, um, yeah, just being flexible with, you know, what families are comfortable with, what I'm comfortable with. Um, and then just finding a way to like meet in the middle and, and still make it therapeutic. Yeah, that's awesome. I think yeah. that's probably a theme for a lot of people. It's like, oh, I can do therapy different ways. Than right. I or, yeah. And yeah. To meet the best needs of our clients. It was interesting what you said about like it being really different at home too, because I would imagine in a clinic, as clinicians, you can have a lot of control of the like mm-hmm. sensory environment. Totally. And at home, not, not necessarily that they're bad sensory environments, but there's going to be more out of the therapist's control that yeah. you might have to address in the moment. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you have, you have pets, you have siblings, you have parents, you right. have that alone. Um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <alone. laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, and the fact that like, this is their safe space. And now all of a sudden, like, Hey, you know, you're having to come in and this is my safe space. And like, why do I have to share this? Or why do I have to listen mm-hmm. to you um, in my safe space? So that's been, you know, a little bit of a challenge and a shift, but um, yeah, I just have really, really loved being able to work on all of those skills that happen at home, you know, being able to get dressed or, you know, eat food at the table or move your food from the table to the sink. Just like I said, all the different right. things that happen at home. You get um, like right in the action almost of the goals yeah. that you're addressing as an OT. Totally. And I think it's, it's been really cool for parents too. I think, um, they've, 
one, it's a little bit easier logistically for them. Um, they don't have to go anywhere, which is kind of nice. Um, but yeah, it's sometimes harder to work on those home-based um, sensory needs or just like functional needs uh, when you're not at home. So um, families have really like, you know, just jumped, you know, head first into all of this and have been really flexible with me and um, have just been, I think have really enjoyed the teaching that parent education piece of all of this within the home yeah. context. So, um, but yeah, still I'm doing a little bit of telehealth for families that are um, more immunocompromised. Um, and so that's been a shift to, you know, having to figure out, okay, well, usually I like provide some like hands-on cueing or mm -hmm. assistance. And now I can't do that. I have to do it with my words through a screen, but um, yeah, I think the, the positive of telehealth has again, been the parent education piece. I mean, so many of my parents are their own best therapists now because they're, they're the ones who are having to get in there and, and right. figure out how to do it and problem solve, or like really listen to what I'm saying to best work with their child. And, um, and so then they can do it when I'm not there. So right. that's been, I think one of the big, big positives that have come out of telehealth. So Yay, that's awesome. And yeah. I think that's a perfect segue into your online sensory activity because this yes. is kind of an example of an online version of OT. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, as Bonnie mentioned in the beginning, we're going to do a little um, activity that I like to call Bubble Mountain. So um, I do this with a ton of kiddos, um, really focusing mostly on the regulation piece. Um, so at home, if you wanted to recreate it, just like Bonnie said, you need a bowl, a little bit of water. I already put a little bit of soap, um, dish soap. So, um, and then a straw. Um, so if you just want to put, yeah, like a splash doesn't have to be too much. Um, but yeah, the goal again is, is regulation. So, um, you know, when kids are bouncing off the walls coming to telehealth or, you know, I'm at their home and they're really wound up and, you know, you're having a hard time focusing. This is a good one. Um, inherently, they're getting a lot of good deep breathing through the straw um, and it's fun to look at. There's a tactile touch piece of, hey, I want to pop the bubbles. I want to get messy. So, um, so yeah, lots of good sensory um, benefits to this. So we will blow some bubbles until we get a mountain now. <laughs> All right. Okay. Pretty good. Here it comes. Well, this is <laughs> huge. <laughs> I know. Need more soap. <laughs> yeah. But the idea, yeah, like you got to work hard on the breath control and um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all deep breathing and regulation. So keep uh, so blowing cool. away. <laughs> awesome. And yeah, so poppable. Like, yep, exactly. Yeah. Inevitably like together that visual. Yeah. I mean, and I, it's so cool to see it's such a simple activity. And this is, again, something that almost every family could access, which I really like. Right. Um, but it's really, really cool to see, you know, the kiddos who are just like super amped for therapy or like, you know, just have been going crazy or had a really rough day at school. And so they're just like freaking out and then doing this activity and seeing them, oh, like deep breathe and and just be ready to focus and regulate um, and move on to something else. So I love that activity. <laughs> yeah, I think I went, I went too hard. I think I got excited. <laughs> it was just like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, oh, that's fun. That's awesome. And as a music therapist, my mind's going of like, oh, you could sing I'm forever blowing bubbles and then yep. like cue the bubble blowing or have that playing in the background um, if that's not too overstimulating and yeah. And add those extra musical aspects to it. Totally. I mean, yeah, there's so many ways this, you know, sitting here just blowing bubbles, like, you know, it, you can make it as easy and simple as you want, but you mm -hmm. can make it as hard as you want to, you know, you sit on a, you know, therapy ball to get, mm -hmm. you know, some, some bouncing and proprioception or vestibular. And just like you, you know, incorporating the music piece, like auditory and coordination, or, you know, all of those things, even motor planning with sequencing. I mean, there's so many ways that a simple activity like this, you can make, you know, more challenging depending on the kiddo. So 
Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like I have a question, but I'm trying, trying, to, <laughs> trying to word it. Uh, I don't know. I feel like it's probably too big of a question. I don't know. I'm trying to think like, how do you as an OT decide like what's too overstimulating? But I feel like that's just like me throwing the most broadest question. No, to you. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, no, that's a really good question. And families are um, oftentimes asking me the same question because yeah, you're like, well, okay, we have therapy in an hour. I don't want to do activities that are overstimulating and going to make them like, you know, their arousal will be too high for therapy. So, you know, what do those just right activities look like for a child? And so that's, yeah, that's where you look at those eight different sensory systems and, you know, say, um, you know, for most kids spinning, for example, so say they're out on the park or, you know, at the playground and they're spinning in the swing, um, that is, you know, really, really stimulating for the sensory system. And oftentimes, you know, if we were maybe at that just right level, maybe it took us up to that high zone um, and can look like, you know, the running around back and forth or, you know, talking really fast or like not, not able to listen because my arousal is so high. Um, so yeah, that's just an example, but it's a great question and it's really very dependent on the child, but, right. um, but yeah, that's why, that's why when I asked it, I was like, oh, but this will be so like individual based, but yeah. Yeah. But again, like that's a, that's an OT's job is to, to help a family figure out, okay, like what are, um, you know, stimulating, like overstimulating activities that we should avoid during these parts of our day or like before this activity, um, and what are the calming activities that are going to help us? Like when we are overstimulated or over aroused, how do we come back down to that just right level? So, um, yeah, very individualistic, but again, that's, right. that's the job of a sensory OT. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question yeah. and then I'll stop throwing them at you. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> um, what advice would you have to give to a, a music therapist, a speech therapist, any, any professional working with the same population in regards to like sensory, is there like any one piece of advice you would give a professional that you're like, you should really know this if you're working with this population? Yeah. I mean, I don't know that it's really like something you should know, but just more of like advice, but you know, okay. like I would just, yeah, like validate and honor all sensory systems. So, you know, when you have your music classes, you know, you might have kids coming in at different sensory level systems and um, they might be having a really hard day or they might be having like a really great day. And so um, I just think like validating and honoring whatever they're feeling sensory um, wise is key. Um, one again for that relationship piece, but um, but who are we to tell them like, no, that's not too loud for you. Or mm -hmm. like, no, that's, this is easy. You can do it. Like, who are we to tell right. a child that like what we know how to do isn't you know, right for their body. So yeah, just more of advice to just honor and validate all sensory systems. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. And I think yeah. that's something that I can take and hopefully other professionals can take into our sessions that we do. So I feel like I like to validate emotions a lot mm -hmm. or choices. And so like, it's that same idea of like validate the sensory processing that's mm -hmm. going on too, and help them find a way yeah. to adjust or adapt in those yeah. environments. Yeah. And I mean, I, it, you could, I could go on for days about like, well, when you see this, then you right. could do this. Maybe but... I'll need to get you back on <laughs> to do <Yeah>. that. <laughs> exactly. I would love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. I think, yeah, there's like very like, you know, common sensory system, you know, patterns that we see. And there are like very common, like when you see this, you can do this, but yeah, ultimately I still think like a child needs to feel safe and secure as who they are, no matter if it looks weird to other kids or it looks weird to us, doesn't matter. We should still validate. So. Right. Awesome. Yay. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. We're kind of yeah. wrapping up. So I'll make sure I get your information in the description, but yeah, I feel like I learned a lot today and I'm excited to share and the bubbles was super fun. Yeah. I'm excited to share that with families and hope that this is awesome information for them too. And yeah, just, I'm excited for what you're doing in the community and to continue watching your business grow. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I'm on um, Instagram and Facebook and um, all the social media platforms, but yeah, just love being able to collaborate and empower other professionals as well as families. So thanks for having awesome. me.
Yeah, of course. All right. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye.